Yeah, good evening. I see several logged in. Good to see you. I'm going to begin with the Word of God. Acts chapter 11. I'm going to read about seven or eight verses beginning at, night, at verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and, and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. I wanted to start with that reading from Acts 11, because I thought it was the, the most important thing that I could say. That is... Uh, to relay the word of God to you. There's a lot of news going on. Um, there's a lot of trouble in our country this evening and a lot of concern about it, but um, <clears throat> there's nothing that, more important that I could say or relay to you than, than the word of God. And the sooner the people who live in this country realize that and get back to that, the, be, the the sooner such troubles will cease. And that starts with us, folks. Um, we, we have to get back to uh, relying on the Word of God and trusting in Him and remembering <clears throat> the Lord who said that my kingdom is not of this world. So that's where I wanted to start. But glad you're you're here to study. Um, I want us to think for two or three sessions about what is a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does that word Christian mean, really, is, is what I'm getting at. And, you know, there are millions and millions of people in the world today who are described as or might describe themselves as Christian. But what does that mean, actually? Uh, it's always been interesting to me, and I don't really know what to do about it, but it's always been interesting to me that the term Christian, although it's by far the most common word we use for a follower of Jesus today, is, is one of the least frequently used terms in the New Testament. You know, it only occurs three times in the New Testament, all 27 books of the New Testament. Only three times do we find the word Christian. Uh, it's much more common to, to refer to followers of Jesus as disciples or servants, something like that. But just three times are they called Christian. And so I want to take a look at each of those three times, uh, since we use the term so much, and see what we can learn about what it says about what it means. Um, and I think in all three places that it occurs, we learn something valuable about what a Christian is, what a Christian is supposed to be. Uh, to begin, let's, let's just notice some common things about this name, Christian. Obviously, it has to do with Christ. It's a reference in some way to Christ that... The ending of the term, I-A-N, that's placed on the end of the term in English, sort of parallels what is there in the original language in the Greek of the New Testament. 
uh, the suffix, it means something like belonging to. So in, in Greek, it, it reads something like Christianus. Uh, in English, Christian is the way it's expressed. And so at its very basic, Christian means one who belongs to Christ. And uh, this the same kind of suffix is used elsewhere in the New Testament. For, for example, uh, you might remember that there's a group of people referred to in the Gospel of Matthew, specifically chapter 22, verse 16. They're called the Herodians. What does Herodian mean? It means those belonging to the family of Herod. So that might give us some insight into what Christian uh, is supposed to mean or, or is supposed to express. We, this basic idea of, of the meaning of Christian, um, we get just by understanding the language a little bit. But I think there's more that we can... Um, we can dig out as well by looking at these three texts where the word occurs in the New Testament. And the first one is, is where we read there in Acts chapter 11. And uh, two, in fact, two of the three times that the, the word Christian is, is found is in the book of Acts. And then one place outside of Acts in, in the letter that we know as 1 Peter, the term is used. And so... Uh, just for our study this evening, we're going to look at this one in Acts 11 for a few more minutes. Uh, the specific verse is verse 26 of Acts 11, but of course we read more than just verse 26 because as always the context is so important as we study God's word. So uh, if you have your Bible open um, in whatever format you have it, you might glance down through this paragraph that runs from verse 19 to verse 26. And uh, the story behind that, uh, that context is, is uh, important to review. You know, we're very early in the history of the church. Um, the church was called into existence on the day of Pentecost, uh, approximately A.D. 33, in the city of Jerusalem. The gospel was preached. Jesus was preached, and thousands of people obeyed that gospel. They responded in faith. They were added to the church on that first day. And as the church grew, as more and more multitudes of people uh, accepted and expressed their faith in Jesus, uh, persecution grew. And so these these new new believers were targeted by the authorities in Jerusalem uh, to be harmed, uh, maybe to try and to intimidate them or to quash this movement. And that just grew uh, for a period of time. That grew in intensity. The first person that we're aware of from Scripture that died for their faith uh, is the early disciple named Stephen. He's stoned to death. And... Uh, he, he was he was speaking the word of Jesus, and he stoned to death as a result. And, and when that happened, most of the early disciples were scattered uh, from Jerusalem and and throughout the area. And and as they went, as they were scattered, they carried the message, the good news of Jesus, with them wherever they went. And so, the effect of the persecution really was to spread the news. Of Jesus. One of the first places that they went, it seems, was the great city of Antioch. Um, Antioch, we're, t we're told, was the third greatest city of the Roman Empire. Of course, you had Rome, the capital, and then uh, the city of Alexandria down in Egypt, and then the third greatest, Antioch, which is uh, up in the region of Syria, up in the north to the north of Israel. And so it's a very important city and, and the church seems to have grown very quickly in Antioch as it did in Jerusalem. And it really became one of the most influential of the early churches of Christ. Uh, it was home base for the missionary work that went out into the Gentile world. You know, it was home base for Paul and his team. They were always going back to Antioch and being sent out from Antioch. And so Paul was there a lot. And other great early leaders like Barnabas uh, 
spent a lot of time in Antioch. Antioch's very important. I don't think it gets enough of our attention in studying about the early church. Uh, we need to know more about Antioch, but it, that's, that's for another study. But the church, again, is growing in, in Antioch early on. And there in verse 24, where we read, it said, a great many were added to the Lord. So a big numbers are believing and turning to the Lord. Verse 21, many, many people are being taught. Verse 26, that's, that's sort of the context of what's going on here. And there are really a lot of important firsts that take place in Antioch, uh, which won't go into in, in great detail, but there are two that I want to mention. The first of these important firsts is this, that in Antioch, the gospel was being preached not just to Jews alone, but also to Gentiles. So we have that um, we have that mentioned in verse 20 of the text. And that really explains much of their growth. They weren't excluding anybody in their proclamation, uh, in their outreach. So, yes, uh, there was Jewish Christian audience in Antioch, no doubt, uh, but Gentiles as well were were learning of Jesus. And as we said, it became sort of the hub of missionary activity uh, after that. So, you know, for us, if as Gentiles, thank God that there were churches like Antioch who pioneered in Gentile outreach and who supported missionaries to go out and, and preach to Gentiles. Uh, if that had never happened, we'd still be lost. We wouldn't have heard. And so that's one of the great things about Antioch. The other first, of course, is really what we're talking about here in, in this study today, and that is, according to verse 26, Antioch is the place where followers of Jesus were first called Christians. The first place the word Christian was used was in Antioch. And I think there's an important lesson for us about being a Christian in that fact. Uh, what do we learn from this passage about this question we're asking? Uh, what is a Christian? Uh, what does the word Christian mean? Well, first, notice that the word Christian is not intended to be a title, but a description. There's a difference between a title and a description. Christian describes a person. It describes a person who truly belongs to, is part of the family of Jesus Christ. One is not born a Christian. One does not inherit their Christianity. One is not a Christian because they're a citizen of a certain nation. Uh, those would all be titles, you see. Christian, when it was first used, was used to describe people who were followers of Christ in Antioch. Then it came to describe all followers of Christ eventually. Uh, and we'll, we'll address this in another study, but there's, there's an idea that, you know, it was originally almost an insult. You know, it was, it was applied to believers in Jesus from, from outsiders as a way of sort of saying those Christers almost. Um, it wasn't necessarily a, a compliment at first. Uh, but the important point being, it's a description. It's not a title. Um, Paul later would write about this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Uh, you remember this passage where the, the apostle says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Uh, this is what we mean when we say that Christian is a description rather than a title. It, it identifies people who belong to Jesus. It signifies ownership, you see. 
When I say I am a Christian, I mean that I belong to Jesus. Uh, lock, stock, and barrel. Okay? That's the idea. And I, I draw a parallel um, to the phrase Church of Christ. Okay? When we say we are the Church of Christ, that is not supposed to be a title for our church. Not if we're going to be biblical about it. Uh, and, and you know, not in the Bible. In the Bible, Church of Christ is a description of a body of believers, a group of Christians. It designates ownership. We are the church that belongs to Christ. It's not and never has been intended by God to be used as a, a name that designates us, separates us from others, um, a denominational name. I know that's how it's used, and sometimes we even do that. But really, originally, it's a description, just like the term Christian is a description. It's not a title, and, and neither is the term Christian. I think it's really important for all of us to keep in mind as we consider this. Uh, secondly, the word Christian, as used here in Acts 11, shows us that there was something different. There was something distinctive about these believers in Antioch. There was some reason somebody started calling them this, you see. They wouldn't have done it if they had just blended in with everybody else. Uh, you know, up to that time, uh, those who believed in Jesus were really looked on as sort of a subset of the Jewish community. Uh, most of them were of Jewish descent. Most of the first Christians, of course, were Jewish. The great, great majority of them were. And they had come to believe in Jesus as Messiah. And their scriptures were the same scriptures. Um, we're talking about time before the New Testament being available. Uh, and so their scriptures were the Old Testament, the Old Testament books. They believed in, they worshiped the same God, the one true God. Now that made them distinct from the world, which worshiped many gods. But as far as Jew, between Jews and Christians, they, they worshiped the same God, the creator. But now you see in Antioch, people began to realize that there was something different that had happened. Something, something different had developed. And uh, these followers of Jesus were not just Jews. Uh, Jews had been around for thousands of years, and, and they were a prominent part of the Roman Empire. Every city of any size would normally have a synagogue, maybe many synagogues. So people knew uh, about the Jews. But now you see something has developed that has caused a change or something new, something distinct, something separate from Judaism with these people. They had become Christians and people started calling them that, you see. And, and, and it's still true that to be a true Christian is to be a distinct person. You, you are to stand out in important ways. You're, you're to be set apart. You are to be distinct from the world around you. People in the world should be able to tell a clear difference in the way you live and the way most other people live. You know, a difference between the two because you live a holy life. Uh, like Jesus did, because you belong to him. Uh, you're not so tied to the things of this world. Uh, you, tur you turn into, or tune into a Bible study on a Wednesday night when it seems like all the world around us is going crazy. You're not, you're not tied into CNN, Fox, whatever. That's different. Okay. You think something's more important than that. It's a way of being distinct. And even among really religious folk, okay, 
uh, there is to be a distinctness. And, and that's what happened here at Antioch. Um, we see the first clear separation from believers in Christ and, and their Jewish brothers and sisters. So you think about parallel today. Um, <clears throat> we live in a community uh, in, in Lancaster, Ohio, or wherever it may be you are. It's probably similar. A community that is fairly religious. There are a lot of churches, a lot of people who claim faith in the same God that we claim faith in and claim devotion to the same Savior. Uh, they're called Christians, you see. The strong tendency these days and the pressure is to just blend in with, with all believers, uh, all of our religious neighbors, and... Uh, but, but really, we can only do that insofar as Jesus allows us to and as his word leads us, you see. We are to be true people of the book. We started this evening with the word of God for a reason. Um, so there's some old slogans that, that people hundreds of years ago used and um, I've heard him a lot from preachers as I grew up. You know, we're to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. Um, call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. Those can be too simplistic, uh, but there are truth in, in those things. It, it shows a reverence for the Word of God. If we do that wisely and faithfully, we will be distinct. You see, we will be a distinct people even in the religious world, and that's what Jesus' people should be. That's what the people in Antioch were who were first called Christians. And finally, let's realize that in Antioch, as described in this text in Acts 11, these Christians, these, these people were obviously known. They were, they were a known people. People in the community knew about them. In fact, uh, they were so known that they were named. Uh, they were given this name, Christian, this descriptor. And so at Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians, you see. And, and I think that's a trait that ought to be a part of, of, of how you, we would think of ourselves, that we would be a known people in our community. Um, that we would be distinct. Do we stand for things that few stand for? Do we teach and preach things no one else does? Not just for the sake of being distinct, but because we've been called to that by, by our Lord and, and by our study of his word. Do we live lives, most importantly, that distinguish us from the world around us? And, and are we getting outside of our building and showing our allegiance to Christ to, to others by word and deed, you see. That is a major part of what it means, really, to be Christian. You can learn a lot from this first reference to um, Christians in Antioch, as it's recorded here in Acts 11. So said the, the next time it occurs is also in the book of Acts and then one reference to, uh, to Christian in 1 Peter. And each of the times, uh, each of the occurrences, we can learn something important. So I hope you'll um, tune back in as we go through this for a couple of weeks. I appreciate you being a part of the study tonight. I hope it's benefited you and, and maybe challenged you a little bit. Let's, let's close our time this evening in prayer. Holy God, we lift our hearts to you in this midweek time. Uh, we need your strength and wisdom and guidance, as always. And, and we're so thankful for your word to us. It's been faithfully handed down to us over the centuries. Help us to be faithful in, in studying it and applying it. Uh, we pray, Father, that more and more will come to know you and that your kingdom will, will come and that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Thank you for this day. Thank you for life. Pray your protection of life and health and most importantly, our spiritual health as we look for the world to come. Thank you for hearing us. I thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.